This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. So we're going to take a look at some examples of step acquisitions and step disposals. Before you look at each one or before I talk about it, it would be a good idea to pause the recording and have a go yourself. So pause the recording and have a look please at example five. And when you've had a go, then resume the recording and I'll talk through the question. In this scenario, there are three group companies, Riley, Hume and Jones. And we notice that there were some changes in group during the year. So in respect of Hume again, they went from 60 up to 70. So that one was 60 to 70%. That's a funny O, isn't it? That's a bit better. 60 to 70%. In respect of the other one, they went down from 90, down by 20, to 70. So this one, they went down from 90% to 70%. So the control threshold is not crossed in either case. So if we are asked to work out goodwill, goodwill must be measured on the day they first got control. So looking here, one of the requirements is to sort out the goodwill. When they first got control of this one, Hume, was when they got the 60%. And when they first got control of the other one was when they got the 90%. So off we go and we'll try and work out the goodwill on both of those companies. So we might try and be a little bit efficient here and see if we could do this using two columns. In the exam, I think it probably adds extra hassle, so I perhaps wouldn't bother with this, but um, I'd perhaps do them separately because you don't want to spend ages formatting stuff. But what I need to know for both, isn't it, is the cost and the NCI less for the subsidiary, its net assets. The way that this question is set up we're going to have to work out the net assets by looking at the share capital and reserves or retained earnings at acquisition. There we are. So we've got some headings in. I think that might work just to get towards the goodwill. Let's do what we do in the exam and just type in the word goodwill at the start. But we'll look at each in turn. First of all, H for Hume or H for Harry. So coming back across here, I'll highlight the key numbers in green. When I bought Hume originally, it was 75 and the NCI was 40. Let's put those two numbers in, 75 and 40. Now, we're told the retained earnings of Hume on that day, it must be somewhere, 25. We're not told the share capital. You have to look at Hume's balance sheet to find that. So here it is, Hume's balance sheet, share capital 80. So I've got share capital of 80 and retained earnings of 25. 80 and 25, that's 105, so 115 less 105 would give me goodwill of 10. Now we're going to look at the other company, 
So I'm looking for the cost of the original 90%, which was 120, and the NCI was 13. Unlucky for some, they say, don't they? 120 and 13. Now, retained earnings were 35. Remember, if you want to find Jones's share capital, you need to look at Jones's balance sheet. So Jones's share capital, 75. So 75 for share capital and 35 for retained earnings. 75 and 35 would be 110. So goodwill is dropping out as 23. That's the first part of the question. The second part of the question is to sort out the adjustment in respect of NCI that's taking place in both of those situations. I don't think I'm going to try and do this in columns. I think we're getting a dreadful mess. So there you are, the difference or adjustment that's posted to retained earnings. So we'll look at these two separately. In the case of Hume, it went from 60 to 70%. So let's have a look now at the adjustment. We're going to look first at Hume. We just said that this one went from 60 to 70. Again, tell yourself what happened to NCI. NCI must have gone from 40 to 30. So in that situation, I've spent some money. So I've got the cost and the change in NCI. The difference is going to retain earnings. So let's hunt around for the numbers. What was the cost of the 10%? So I'm going to highlight now in blue the cost of the 10%. The cost of the 10%, where is it? Was 15. I'll put that in before I forget it. Now, the change in the NCI, well, what do we know about the NCI? What we know about the NCI is that on the date that the, N the change took place, the NCI was 56. Let's just write that number down for a minute and then try and think about what's happening. That NCI represented 40% of the company. We're going from 40 to 30%. So think about that carefully. If you had four slices of cake and then later you only had three slices of cake, you've lost one slice, one quarter of the cake. So it's very tempting to get this in a real mess. But 40% of the company is 56. We're getting rid of 10. So that's 10 fortieths. Think of a cake in four quadrants. One quadrant is going because instead of having four slices, we've got three, 40 to 30. It's a bit counterintuitive, I think, isn't it? So 56 times 10 over 40 would be 14. 
So the difference is one. Again, remember what's happening there. I would be spending money, crediting cash, debiting NCI. The difference is actually going to be a debit to retain earnings. Or you could say cash goes down, NCI goes down, and retained earnings go down, but it's not a loss or anything like that. It's just an adjustment. So if you were struggling with that one, maybe have a look at the other one now and pause the recording before I go through it. We're now going to look at Jones. Don't know where that cheeky little arrow came from. We're now going to look at Jones. So Jones, this is where what's happened in Jones, remember, is that I think we've gone from 90 to 70%. So we had an NCI, was it 90 or was it 80? Yes, it was 90, wasn't it? We went from 90 down by 20% to 70. Yeah, so I had an NCI of 10% and now I've got an NCI of 30%. The NCI is going from 10 to 30%. Money comes in, so the proceeds or of sale were how much? The proceeds of sale, again highlighting in blue, were 35. Proceeds of sale, 35. Change in NCI, difference as always, going to retain earnings. What do we know about the NCI? On the date the change took place, the NCI was 14. Let's write that number down. Fourteen represents a ten percent NCI, but it's going to increase, isn't it, by another twenty percent? It's going from ten to thirty. It's going up by twenty, and you almost want to go back to those problems you used to solve at school, when if ten bananas cost fourteen dollars, what was the cost? of 20 bananas and you go $28. Easy with bananas, isn't it harder with this? But this NCI is doubling, tripling, I'm sorry, in size, isn't it? It's like X plus 2X equals 3X. Don't know where the algebra came from. We'll avoid that. So the old interest was 10%. The change, again, is 20 so it's going up, isn't it, by 28. 35 minus 28 is 7. As I said, I would probably wouldn't bother to start learning formally for that. You'll only be doing one. Just think about it for a minute, and I think you'll get it right. And double entry, debit cash, credit NCI, debit cash, credit NCI. It looks to me as what, have we got this the right way down? Yes, we have. It looks to me like there's a credit to retain earnings. So I think on that one, the cash is going up by 35. The NCI is going up by 28. To make it balance, retained earnings will go up by seven. But as we keep saying, it's not a proper profit or loss.
in a minute, we'll have a look at the next example. Example six. So pause the recording and have a look at it before you listen. So every question is different, will always be asked different things. So in this situation here, there was a change partway through the year. The change took place on the 1st of April. So if I draw a timeline across the page, there we are. There's January. There's the 1st of April. I'm sure this isn't to scale, but never mind. And there's the 31st of December. Up until April, January, February, March, there are three months or three twelfths of the year. April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, nine months of the year. For the first part of the year, we owned 75% of Tansy. Later, we sold 10%. So therefore, after that, we're only owning, aren't we, 65%. So my stake in the business goes from 75 to 65 the NCI stake goes from 25 to 35. Now, if we were doing a balance sheet, all you would need to worry about is the NCI at the end of the year, because the balance sheet is at a point in time. But this question is asking you about the profit and loss, and that's the story of the year, isn't it? So anything that's in the P&L lends itself to time apportionment. So actually, the NCI, when we tell the story of the year, the NCI for the first part of the year is not the same as the NCI for the rest of the year. So we have to do a little bit of time apportioning in there, but we will be calm. The only number that is important is the subsidiary's profit after tax, which is 146, that's the number of which the NCI are entitled to their share. So let's have a go at solving this now. Example six, and you can perhaps see where we're going to go. I'm trying to prove the NCI. So it's a little bit of time apportionment. The first part of the year is three twelfths. The second part of the year is nine twelfths. For the first part of the year, I had 75, so they had 25. For the second part of the year, I had 65, so they had 35. Times the profit after tax, Profit after tax, we highlighted, it was 146. I'm sure you could probably do a shorter working, but I can't. So, 3 twelfths of 25% of 146, I think, is 9.125. 9 twelfths of 35% of 146 is 38.325. So that would give you 47.45 or 45450, which I think should tie back to the solution. So NCI, again, what we're having to do there is that we must time apportion it 
in the profit and loss. As always, or splocky, we're not doing a whole P&L, but if we see an extract, that's what you need to do. It's only really an issue where you've got um, a big S becoming a little S or a little S becoming a big S. Um, uh, normally, that's when the little problem arises. Now, pause the tape again and have a look now at example seven. Some of you will be quite cross because there's no reference there to any numbers at all, apart from the group structure. And this is what you will be asked to do in the exam, alongside the calculations. Just have a read of it for a moment and then listen to me again. Can you see, it's a three-stage process. First of all, 25% for some period of time. Later, it goes up to 80%. And later, it goes up to 90%. And that's what we can use again to start to drive out our answer. 25 to 80 to 90. So we would need to do three subheadings in our answer. 25%, 80 and 90. By now, I know that you can write sentences because you've got this far through the exam process. So I'm going to tend to write a bit more note form but let's think what would be in the marking guide for each of those. So this is example seven. I'd have three subheadings. Um, I'm actually going to put them across the page. I wouldn't do that again in the exam, but just so we can see the whole situation. Then we go up to 80%. Then we go up to 90%. So 25, 80 and 90. So what words would we see in a marking guide typically? 25% again would be associated with the word significant influence which would be associated with the word associate. And of course, the phrase equity accounting. And then you would explain how equity accounting works. So the fact that in the soft P, you would be showing cost plus share of post acquisition profits. And in the splocky, you'd be showing the share of profit after tax and also the share of OCI. There's also impairment, but there's only so much that you can get down in the exam. When you go across to 80%, the key message, isn't it, is that you have crossed the control threshold. Da -da. So therefore, the company is now a subsidiary. And in respect of that, that would be associated with the word consolidate or consolidation. You might then just say, but briefly, that it means that you add 100% of the assets of liabilities together. Don't forget, you can keep pausing this if I, what I write is too quick. 
So we could add 100% of the assets and liabilities together. You would also explain that you would calculate goodwill using fair values and I would also mention of course that the old investment is in a sense being derecognized and there'll be a gain or loss in the profit and loss. So also there'll be a gain or loss on the sale of the old 25% investment and that will be recognized in the profit and loss. One of the things that you have to be very careful about is if you mention any kind of adjustment, tell them where they should stick it. P&L, OCI or somewhere else, but this of course is the P&L. The printed answer to this again has a little bit more detail and you can see if you look at the printed answer afterwards again how much it would be a good idea to write. Finally, from 80 to 90% is seen as a transaction between shareholders or transaction with the NCI. So there is no further calculation of goodwill. There's no change in goodwill. But there will be an adjustment in the SOSI statement of changes in equity or in retained earnings if you prefer and that would be the difference between the cost of the investment and the change in the NCI. So the difference between the cost of the investment and the change in the NCI. The key thing is pretend you're writing it for an auntie. So think of one of your aunties or something who's, you know, just a regular intelligent person. And then say, well, maybe you've got an auntie that's got a shop or an uncle. Would they understand what you've written? If you've actually written something that looks like it's been written by Archimedes in Greek, no good. Keep it simple. Don't try and bamboozle people. This is what happens and this is where the adjustment goes. There we are. That's all about writing up questions where there's a change in group structure.